Hi, Sark Centeno, and thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, you've got the power. I'm uh, going to be talking today about vestibular migraine. Um, and, and as you probably know, I tend to focus these uh, discussions on what I come about uh, or what I get exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis practicing medicine. And so this last week, I saw two patients that have gotten this diagnosis, vestibular migraine. And I thought it was interesting enough to, to talk about because I think uh, there are patients getting this diagnosis out there. And uh, in many cases, those patients are uh, kind of going down the neurology track towards uh, migraine headache treatments. This particular subset of patients isn't really getting much relief there. So they're kind of just... Um, out of luck, if you will. And yet many of these patients have very specific things wrong that aren't being identified um, and treated. And so, you know, they ultimately get put in this box called vestibular migraine. And then when nothing helps, you know, they're kind of then investigating other diagnoses. Is there something else wrong with me? There's something else going on, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to get into that today. Hopefully, we will help some people who have got this diagnosis figure out what's wrong uh, rather than getting put into a box for which are, there is no treatment. So uh, let's dive into that. So again, we're going to get into what is vestibular migraine. I'll do a short presentation on that. Then we'll open the floor up to questions. You can ask questions about this or really anything at all. Um, so uh, let me go ahead here and share my screen. And we will start that presentation. Here we go. Okay, so what is vestibular migraine? Uh, and again, this is something, if you're just joining us, this is something that I see where patients get this diagnosis. You know, they're usually in the neurology track, as I call it, when they get this diagnosis. They're put on um, some migraine headache medications. Many times those don't work. Maybe they're sent to a little PT for the dizziness component. Um, but when that doesn't work, they're kind of stuck. And uh, they then start sort of jumping into other tracks to try to get some help. So the basics of vestibular migraine are you've got someone who has migraine headache-like symptoms. Uh, you've got someone who has dizziness or imbalance. And this is episodic. It gets better and worse. Now, many times the whole migraine headache thing isn't really looked at with a lot of rigor, meaning a migraine headache is supposed to have an aura, meaning you're supposed to be able to tell you're going to get a migraine headache. Um, and that's a very sp specific vascular event. However, you know, migraine is a little bit like Band-Aid, right? Band-Aid is the brand name for a bandage. We all know if you say Band-Aid, you're talking about bandage. But there might be 20 different kinds of bandages out there that we might call Band-Aid. Same thing with migraine. Migraine has become kind of like a catch-all term for headaches. But from a medical standpoint, migraine headaches are very specific. They're more a vascular event. They have an aura with them. The patient can normally have some sort of neurologic symptom that precedes their headache. They don't get worse with things like turning your head, etc. Um, and yet, despite that, that term gets used to really describe all headaches, which is not medically appropriate. And if we look at the actual diagnostic criteria for vestibular migraine, here it is from this 2015 paper. Bottom line, it's what I just went over, basically. Uh, migraine type symptoms with some dizziness or vestibular component and it kind of is episodic, doesn't last for more than a couple days at a time. Now, what causes vestibular migraine? If you go into this uh, paper here from 2015, they've got all these complex uh, neurological things going on here. 
where you're looking at different areas of the brain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and for some patients in this category, this may be true. But in general, what I see is uh, many of these people really have neck problems. And what you don't see on here is anything regarding the neck. So what I would say is this is the, um, this is the neurology explanation of what happens with vestibular migraine. It's probably not the common sense interpretation, nor very scientific. It looks very scientific, but it's not really. Um, and what I mean by that is that in medicine, many times, once you get down a track with a particular provider, like in this case, a neurologist, there's a very specific set of diagnoses that you're headed for. Um, and in this case, we see neurologists who generally don't understand the spinal causes of headache, meaning things like upper neck facet joints, occipital nerves. They may kind of understand occipital nerves, so they'll sometimes do a blind occipital nerve block. But when it comes to upper neck joints, for example, causing headaches, it's going over their head. They really have no idea. They don't do those procedures. They've never done that kind of procedure before and seen that it takes people's headaches pain away. So they don't understand it. Um, and so we get to this parable of the blind men inspecting an elephant. Um, and so at the end of the day, this happens with this vestibular migraine diagnosis, right? You see someone with a headache. That person's got a headache. They also have vestibular symptoms. And so the next thing you know, they get this label of vestibular migraine. And they're off on that neurology track when, in fact, they really just had an upper neck joint, which is giving bad information to the brain and causing headache. And so they never get that diagnosed, which is a little frustrating, I think, obviously, for me as a provider and obviously for you as a patient. So, for example, and there's lots of other things in the spine that cause headaches, but, you know, here we have three joints, zero, one. Uh, one, two, and two, three, all of these are involved to a certain one degree or another in position sense of the head or what's called proprioception. So if they give bad information to the brain, you can get dizzy and feel like you don't have normal balance. We also know that pain in any one of these facet joints or that due to injury or something else can cause headache. So this is the most common sense probably most frequent cause of, quote, vestibular migraine, meaning people with headaches who are dizzy. But if you get on this neurology track and get that diagnosis, it's very unlikely this is going to be looked at or investigated. Now, the obvious spinal cause, as I talked about before, is because we have this system for determining normal balance. And that is we've got visual input coming in from our eyes. We've got inner ear input coming in from the inner ear semicircular canals. And then we've got upper neck input. And all three of those things give information about balance that gets coordinated in the brain. But when one of those areas starts to give bad information, in this case, the neck, as you can see there off to the lower left, the brain gets confused. It's got one piece of information coming in from the neck that doesn't agree with the information coming in from the uh, inner ear and the eyes. So, so it, it doesn't know which end is up. You get dizzy and you've got poor balance. Now, you know, what usually needs to be treated in these patients? The upper cervical facet joints, if those are the issues as we've talked about. But again, because they're in that neurology track, this doesn't really ever get investigated. And how would you determine if those upper neck joints are causing, quote, vestibular migraine? A hands-on exam. Now, I couldn't get chat GPT to have this guy actually inject the back, or I'm sorry, inspect the back of this person's neck. So that would be what needs to be shown here, not uh, palpation of the front, but these joints are in the back. And what you should expect from your medical provider is you're lying face up on a table. Usually they are um, sitting down um, near your head. You're lying face up. They've got the, their hands on the back of your neck 
and they are testing joint by joint. So they're testing zero one, they're testing one, two, they're testing two, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, seven, seven, one. And they're trying to see if those joints are tender or provoke symptoms. And then obviously, once you identify which joints seem to be tender or provoke symptoms, then you can treat that painful joint with an x-ray guided and contrast confirmed injection to see if those symptoms go away. And again, this hands-on exam is not trivial, it takes a while to do. So, you know, you, you should be getting at least a 20 minute hands-on exam of lots of different things, including all of these joints in the neck. Again, this picture isn't accurate because I couldn't get chat GPT to have the guy examine the back of the neck. All I could get out of the chat GPT was this kind of exam, but it's kind of a cool picture. So what percentage of patients who have the diagnosis of vestibular migraine have had this type of workup where they've had a good hands-on exam inspecting each of those facet joints? There's 14 of them in the neck. And they've also had then a diagnostic block to see if those symptoms go away when you numb out that joint. Very, very few. And that's the frustration for me as a provider and I'm sure for many, many patients, obviously, who get this diagnosis, they're kind of put into this box where there's nothing to do if they fail physical therapy or if the migraine headache medications don't work. So in conclusion, the upper neck is a common cause of what gets labeled as vestibular migraine. Um, and for you CCI patients, you should know that this is a label that not uncommonly gets applied to CCI patients. And regrettably, this label isn't all that helpful in identifying what needs to be treated in this patient population. So let me uh, get out of that one and we'll go to see if we've got questions, which we do. So I will start answering those questions now. Uh, Rishi, is possible the PICL could tighten ligaments so much that it starts to cause compression of nerves or certain structures like arteries and veins? Haven't seen that, Rishi, wouldn't make common sense. So I, I don't think so, no. Uh, Rishi, when hydrodissecting occipital nerves, is it possible for the plate lysate to heal other structures by spreading out what's injected, like, for example, rectus capnus muscles and SCM? Certainly possible, yes. Uh, Regenix, been advanced by Christy Mater. Would you consider switching magnesium stearate in your stem cell supplement to vegetable cellulose? Dr. Bay, a neurologist who specializes in vestibular migraines, has found that magnesium stearate can be a migraine trigger. I have both CCI migraines. I find this uh, filler really flares my symptoms. Don't think we'd make that accommodation. Um, no, but you can certainly go ahead and you know, replicate what's in that stem cell support formula. Uh, and then you know, just do that and part it out with all the parts that work for you. Um, but remember, you know, as we've talked about here, migraine has a very specific connotation in medicine. It's a vascular type headache with an aura. Uh, and many, many times what gets labeled as migraine is really just uh, pissed off upper neck joints. So if no one's really investigated those pissed off upper neck joints, that's probably what's causing your vestibular migraine not the brain, as has been discussed uh, here. Kimmy, I brought the laser and charts, did the laser eye exercises, but should I wait until after PICL to start? You know, Kimmy, it's certainly okay to try to do those beforehand. It will be important information for the doctor to know where, how far you can get. Um, so I would do it before. That way you can say, hey, you know, I couldn't get past level one or... I got to level three and then I maxed out. I couldn't do it anymore. That's all very helpful information for your doctor. Uh, Peter, hi doctor, what is the best interval between PICL one and two for the best results? Yeah, we usually recommend um, three to four months in there. The, the soonest we'll do it is three months, um, but it can really on average go to four to six months. Realize that for some of our patients who are very sensitive to these procedures, it takes longer. Um, and so for some patients, uh, and those fragile egg patients in particular, their best interval could be longer than that. 
Um, so it's very individualized, but for most patients, it's four to six months, sometimes as little as three. Uh, Submit advanced by Sherry Scott. Uh, are migraines more common in CCI patients? And if you have CCI and get migraines, does that affect your effectiveness of the PICL procedure? No, but most CCI patients don't really have true migraines. They just have headaches being caused by the upper neck structures. So again, what I tried to, to get at during the lecture part of this is this simple concept that at the end of the day, migraine is just a term that gets applied to anyone with a headache. But most of those patients who have had that term applied to them don't have migraines. Um, they just have headaches being caused by the upper neck when it comes to CCI. So their headaches have very little to do with the migraine type headaches that you see out there where someone gets a migrainous aura, maybe their, you know, their face goes numb and then they get a, a headache that's very specific on one side and they take a migraine medication like Imitrex and boom, it goes away reliably 80%. They're functional now. Uh, and they can even take Imitrex just when their face goes numb before they get the headache and they never get the headache. So that's a migraine, which is very different than most of the types of headaches that CCI patients get. But many of them get labeled as migraine because the neurology track doesn't really understand upper neck related headaches. Raj, hi doctor, I wanted to come on your PICL trial, but I feel the questionnaire correctly, filled out the questionnaire correctly maybe, and was excluded based on joint hypermobile ligaments. Can I reapply? Um, sure, I would just contact Aaron. Aaron Dotson would have been the person who um, had helped you with that. She'd be the person to recontact. AT, confirm with Dr. Katz that this overhang reductions case study was in chronic patients and he has no improvement range of motion as well. Still curious how, how their ligaments healed as they were chronic. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'll have to talk to uh, Evan more about that, but that's certainly good information uh, to have. Andy, are you trying to open up hunched thoracic posture in hypermobile patient? Or if you're trying to open it up, can this be done with ultrasound only? So what are outside ligaments that take four to six pro treatments? What is treated? Um, I think what you're asking is if we're just injecting the supraspinous interspinous ligaments with prolo, can that be done under ultrasound? And the answer is yes, that's a fairly superficial um, injection and that can be done using ultrasound pretty easily. What you wouldn't wanna do with ultrasound is to go deeper into the upper cervical spine. Uh, that's where it gets dangerous. And so I think I've done one of these lives on a clinic out there that was using ultrasound to try to inject the C1, C2 facet joint. Just not a smart thing to do, pretty high risk. Um, but if you're just going for the supraspinous interspinous ligaments, which I think is what you're talking about here, then yes, that can be done or done very well under ultrasound. Uh, Gene, uh, nope, suggested, I'm not quite sure what that's in response response to Gene. Maybe it was to somebody else. Andy, uh, AT, I think that sometimes ligaments can heal with rest. Uh, there's case spread over chronic, not something to get ligament lesion MRI going after one full year of hard collar bracing. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the downside of one year of full hard collar bracing is you end up with a patient who has such severe neck atrophy, you've now got a new problem to treat. So not really recommended at all. Uh, Raj, upper cervical facet joint treated by stem cell or PRP, not prolotherapy. Um, yeah, Raj, if we're talking about, I'm not quite sure what the question is, but I think the question is, um, can the upper neck facet joints be treated with either prolotherapy, PRP, or stem cells? The answer is uh, PRP or stem cells would be better treatments there. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, not the least of which would be if you were to, were to inject prolotherapy solution into the vertebral artery, inadvertently you would kill the patient. Um, if you would inadvertently inject PRP or stem cells into a vertebral artery, um, while you may have an embolic event, probably not, um, you're not going to have the same types of issues 
Um, so that's one thing on the wrist side. Then it is, as we've talked about here, if you're going to get those upper neck facet joints injected, zero, one, one, two, two, three, you need digital subtraction angiography with uh, contrast and uh, fluoroscopy in order to do that safely. Uh, Paul, uh, for how long after a PRP treatment would you avoid curcumin, given it appears curcumin is a COX-2 inhibitor just like NSAIDs? I think it's COX-1, Paul. Um, uh, so I don't think it, it's a, as big a deal uh, as non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. But if you wanted to be super safe, um, I would give it two to three weeks. What you're trying to avoid with either one of those is any blunting of that ac acute inflammatory effect. Uh, Pitor, how often during PICL do you see, for, see on fluoroscopy a patient with an intact transverse ligament and a completely ruptured ALAR? Yeah, we don't see the ligaments under fluoroscopy unless we're obviously putting contrast into them. Um, and we generally don't see uh, completely ruptured ligaments in this patient population at all. Um, that's usually a misnomer that's created by a report that isn't accurate. So if you look at a high field three Tesla MRI of these ligaments, um, the number of fully ruptured ligaments, meaning um, completely torn, retracted back like a rubber band, that I have seen in thousands of patients, I could put onto one hand. Um, and those were severely disabled patients. So it's not really a thing in this patient population or, or it doesn't occur commonly enough to be a concern. Regenics, been advanced by Harry Winston. What percentage of CCI patients have this issue? Is it something you should look at if we get migraines? Um, I, I think, a, well, so, Many, many CCI patients have dizziness slash imbalance and headaches, not caused at all by migraine type activity, but caused by issues in the upper neck. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there isn't some percentage, maybe one in 10 CCI patients who get mislabeled as vestibular migraine. Andy, uh, if I got this correct, my feeling of looseness likely went away after C7 or C2 to C7 uh, facet prolo under C arm because of pain inhibition going away instead of capsules tightening down. Um, could be, yeah, I, I don't know for sure, but yeah, that could be one explanation. Um, but again, those facet capsules aren't providing a lot of stability. Uh, I think I've talked about this before. So C45, C56, C67 facet capsules uh, in most middle-aged and older patients are so incompetent on the medial side that um, we can put stuff into that facet joint and get reliably into the epidural space. So the facet capsules, by the time you hit middle age, are not doing a lot for stability. Uh, Rash, high concentrated PRP. Yeah, Raj, so this is an important topic. I should probably do a Facebook Live just on this um, because I've done a lot of other things on it. Um, I've blogged on it quite a bit, but it probably needs a Facebook Live all to all unto itself. So here's a good rule. If you're going to get PRP and you're looking for um, getting concentrated PRP, which you would need if you were middle-aged or older, uh, you really need to see a blood draw that, depending on what the doctor wants to do, is a minimum of 50 mLs um, and usually a couple hundred mLs. Um, so what does that look like? For example, if you go in for PRP and a doctor goes down and you know those little blood tubes they draw for if you get a blood test, they're eight mLs. So if a doctor takes two of those and tries to make PRP from that to inject your knee or a couple of facet joints in your neck, just leave. It, it's useless. You're, you're not going to get concentrated PRP out of that volume. You would need a much, much higher uh, amount drawn. Now, if you sit down and let's say the doctor wants to inject, let's say you're 50 years old, the doctor wants to inject two, let's say three facet joints in your neck and some ligaments, and the doctor takes 10 of those, 
Now we're in the range, right? Now we're taking 80 mLs, they're eight mLs each. And we are now in the range of uh, being able to get to highly concentrated PRP. Um, so that's one way you can tell if you really with uh, the A team, the B team or the C team. Um, you're with the C team if they're using two tubes or one tube of blood to make PRP. You're with the A team if they're taking 100, 200 mLs of blood to make your PRP. Um, so there are other things you can look at. There are other metrics to consider, but that's an easy one. How much blood are they taking? And if the answer is one or two blood tubes, uh, you're in the wrong spot. You're getting ripped off uh, because the doctor really doesn't have the ability or knowledge then to get to highly concentrated PRP, meaning, uh, and for someone my age, for example, um, really looking at PRP concentrations in the 10 times concentrated all the way up to 20 times concentrated. And so to inject my knee, for example, let's say both knees, uh, six cc's of PRP is what I want to end up with. You had better start with 200 cc's of blood. You wouldn't even use tubes. You'd take half a blood bag uh, on, on me personally. Ryan, uh, coming off my first PICL in early April for type 2B, also have contrast head or constant, sorry, head pressure and very sore skull to touch. Could this be coming from facet joints? Could this check during the appointment? Yeah, head pressure can frequently, or you're coming down for your first PICL. Yes, we can check that on exam. Head pressure can be caused by lots of different things. Um, one of the things it can be caused by is uh, that someone is uh, having an increased pressure in the CSF in the head or intracranial hypertension. But more often in my experience, it's either due to a, uh, a bursal effusion, meaning swelling in the bursa, uh, the bursa that's in the upper neck between C1 and C2, or swelling within a facet joint. So a lot of things that get labeled as intracranial hypertension are really just swollen bursas or swollen, swollen joints. Paul, do I say it's inhibit long-term PRP results when starting use after six weeks? Probably not. Um, now, it's interesting. We do know from large uh, observational studies that patients that are on NSAIDs or oral corticosteroids tend to have more chronic pain um, when adjusting for other things. Why is that happening? It's probably because those NSAIDs are blunting that initial healing response. Now, it also could be that NSAIDs are blunting something else in that healing process further down the line. But if I had to guess, and we really don't know the answer to this at this point, I would say six weeks, you're probably safe with getting back on NSAIDs. It's probably the blunting of that Initial inflammatory response, which is causing more problems, arthritis and pain down the road, because that's how we heal. And while it's convenient to want to blunt that, you don't go through that big recovery period. It's probably causing more problems and disability in the patients that take those medications. Uh, Raj, why does it take so long to heal with PRP? Um, it just depends on what it is you're trying to heal. Um, so, for example, if you're trying to treat knee arthritis, in my experience, three or four weeks is when it starts to feel better. Uh, if you're trying to treat uh, a messed up tendon, it could take three months to feel better. Um, so a lot of it just depends on what it is you're treating. And a lot of it also depends on the patient. How severe is that patient? How much systemic inflammatory uh, in the way of systemic inflammatory issues does that patient have, et cetera? Pator, do you keep cystics? Now, I'm a patient treated with PSCL of a completely ruptured alar ligament, not just an elongated one. Like I said, Peter, it is an extremely small number, so there's no reason to even keep cystics on it. I've only seen it a handful of times, maybe two or three times. And in half of those, um, I don't think the person was born with a ligament. So completely ruptured ligaments, meaning um, you know, completely ruptured, pull back like a rubber band, that's not a thing in this patient population. Now, you may have a report that says something like that. Maybe it says that there's a complete signal change, 
or maybe you have one of the silly DMX reports that says damaged ALR ligament. Um, I hate those reports because at the end of the day, they're really more for med legal purposes than they are for reality, meaning that you that person has a stretched ALR ligament, not a, quote, damaged, because when people hear damage, they think just like this. Oh, my ALR ligament's completely ruptured. We can take a three Tesla uh, MRI of 100 patients that have uh, DMX reports that say damaged ALR ligament. Not a single one of them will be completely ruptured. Giselle, high doctor C with barometric pressure fluctuations also trigger CCI mediated vestibular attacks with central nystagmus, numb lip, and muscle tremors. This clearly be a vestibular migraine. Um, yeah, barometric, barometric pressure and facet pain is an interesting concept, right? If you think about a facet joint or really any joint, um, it's a little barometer. Um, and what I mean by that is there are reasons that old people move to Florida and Arizona, right? Why do they move to Florida or Arizona? They tend to avoid those cold temperatures where the cold fronts and the low pressure zones come through and their joints swell. And when their joints swell, they can, they act like little barometers. So same thing in the facets. Um, so low barometric pressure can cause the joints, including the facet joints to swell. That then causes symptoms related to those facet joints if they're upper cervical facet joints. What you get is, uh, is upper cervical symptoms, which can be uh, vestibular symptoms, uh, et cetera. So just realize that that's probably what's happening there. Probably not really seeing a migraine uh, in all likelihood as much as you're seeing just the effect of um, pissed off upper neck joints and instability. Kimmy, have you had any patients that got aura and migraine separately? I'm not sure what that one means. I got diagnosed with migraines early in the process of finding out about CCI, but my headaches are one-sided and feel occipital. OA takes them away, but so did Imitrex. I get random visual auras, flashy zigzags that move across my visual field about 30 minutes, one hour, but no pain. Yeah, an aura in particular has to be associated with a, with a migraine event for it to be called an aura. So that means that um, you would have to have the visual stuff, and that would pretty much always be followed by a headache. If you have just visual stuff, then there's something else causing the visual stuff and it's not considered uh, an aura. Uh, Rishi, um, could a patient request BMAC only for PICL? I understand the recovery would be tougher. Yeah, we just did that. Um, I want to say it was not this week, but the week before, uh, last week we did that. Uh, there was a patient that came in, never had any problems with uh, recovery, really quick recoveries, wanted BMC put into everything. We did that. I have to say the patient was a little surprised by how sore she was. Um, you know, I think it's the difference between uh, for her getting a neck injection that didn't feel like it was a big deal and getting hit with a baseball bat. Um, I think she'll do fine, but just realize it, it definitely has a bigger punch to it. Uh, Rishi, does GON nerve link and connect to the LON nerve? Do they link together? I don't believe so. Now they, uh, so no, they're coming out of diff completely different areas. So lesser occipital nerve is coming out of the superficial cervical plexus underneath the sternocleidomastoid and then coming up this way. Uh, greater occipital nerve is more linked to the third occipital nerve is branching off and then coming in the back here. So they're coming from two completely different, even parts of the neck. Uh, one coming anterior and then going slightly posterior, the other one uh, coming posterior and staying posterior. Aaron, if a patient has tethered cord diagnosis showing on MRI, would you recommend a tethered cord release for PICL? No. Um, yeah, Aaron, uh, we're really not talking about tethered cord. So let's, Let's make sure we're talking about the same thing here. There's a cult tethered cord. A cult tethered cord is very different than tethered cord. Tethered cord in the neurosurgical community means there's a tumor 
or it means there's been a surgical scarring where the bottom of the spinal cord, the conus medullaris, is pulled much, much lower than it should be. That is completely different than a colt tethered cord. A colt tethered cord is a diagnosis that 99.9% .9 of neurosurgeons don't agree exist. And so we've got a very small slice of neurosurgeons that believe in a cult tethered cord and treat it. And a cult tethered cord is this concept that there's too much pulling on the cord and that, that we can see things like um, atrophy of the phylum terminale, which is the thing that pulls the cord down, and that the only way to treat that is to cut that phylum terminale. Um, so tethered cord release is a much, much, much more invasive procedure than a PICL. Um, so you never do more invasive procedures first. Um, you always do less invasive procedures first. Now, if you did a PICL and then got tethered cord release because it was really felt that that was a, important for you, then that would make more sense because then you would solve the instability issue, hopefully, with the PICL, and that's less invasive. And maybe you never need the tethered cord release, but maybe in the one in 10 chance you do, you get it, and you didn't expose yourself to more risk than you needed to. But the tethered cord release is much, much more invasive than a PICL, so you'd never put it first. Um, and I think it's important to have that discussion with your provider who has talked to you about PICL and CCI because it, it's it's a tough one. I, I don't believe that most people that are getting tethered cord releases are getting lots of benefits, and I don't. And, and I think the the complication rate is very high. Giselle, um, post concussive patient with BPPV and vestibular hypofunction. Vertigo and pressure and positional changes, dizziness with neck turns, and I've been diagnosed with vestibular migraine. Um, yeah, so again, I would say um, there's probably, that that's probably not an accurate diagnosis uh, because it doesn't tell us a lot about what's happening to you um, and that there could be a... Um, a much more succinct reason for why you get those symptoms. Uh, realize the vestibular migraine is just a box. And it's not even a very good box because uh, a good diagnostic box tells us what's wrong and what we need to do to treat it. Vestibular migraine generally doesn't get us there. It's just descriptive, right? Someone's got a headache and they got some dizziness. Doesn't say why those things are happening. Ryan. How to determine whether to treat facet joints with PRP or bone marrow concentrate? Um, we always try them with PRP first. If they fail, we can always go to bone marrow concentrate. Kimmy, I have a friend that believes they have CCI, but recent imaging shows for tubal arteries dissecting. Is this someone you avoid working on just based on that? Should they send imaging your way? Yeah, they've got dissected for tubal arteries. They have to get that taken care of first um, before we would consider seeing them as a PICL patient. Archie, uh, how is the swollen bursa treated? Um, so if we're talking about the upper cervical bursa that we were mentioning before, then um, in that case, you try to get rid of the craniocervical instability that's causing the extra motion that's causing the swollen bursa. Uh, you can also inject the bursa directly, which frequently happens during a PICL procedure um, as well. AT, although you don't have any hard evidence based on your clinical experience, do you think most patients can regain close to full segmental muscle from atrophy loss with specific PT? It's a good question. I don't know that we, like I said, probably previously that we have the answer to that one yet. I'm hopeful that they can. Robert, is there some post-muscle work that PICL patients need as the AP muscles have suffered for a long time? Not sure if you've got some sort of damage that doesn't heal naturally. Yeah, Robert, we try to get patients back into that as quickly as they will tolerate it. So that's why we have those post-PICL exercises. Um, if someone can get all the way through those, 
then we'll move them into more directed physical therapy with a physical therapist. Um, so yes, there definitely is for sure. Uh, Rishi, uh, is there evidence that alpha lipoic acid helps with nerve pain? I don't know the answer to that one. It's not a search I've done in a while. So not, not sure. Uh, Valerie, neurologist diagnosed with simple migraine, medication no help, neck was never examined. So frustrating considering I've CCI symptoms but not acknowledged in the UK. Is they worth trying first before algo cell? Yeah, so Valerie, the, you're the reason why this video was done. Because, you know, I, I talked to two patients um, over about a week's time that had this diagnosis. They were both really frustrated, like you're frustrated. No one had ever examined their neck, even though both of them had neck pain. Um, and so that's why I included the information in this video about the neck exam. Um, and um, so, yes, I think trying AO is a good idea. I know uh, Ian Smith is there. He does a great job. And I think it would be a good thing to try. And then you can see how that goes. Um, and then you can certainly see the guys at Algocell and, and see what they're comfortable treating. Uh, I think as we talked about before on this channel, if you've got certain types of CCI, that can be very helpful to get those posterior injections. If it's another type of CCI, probably not going to work. And then you would need those anterior PICL injections that are only done in, in Colorado. But I think that's a good thing to think about. And I appreciate you bringing that up because your frustration is the reason why I did this video here today. Paul, can PRP be effective against long-term mixed inflammatory disease? I don't know what mixed inflammatory disease is. Um, so I'm not sure if PRP can be effective against it. Um, uh, we've got chronic inflammation, we've got acute inflammation, um, if you're talking about some sort of inflammatory problem linked to a specific uh, diagnosis, maybe get into that diagnosis uh, more deeply. Chris, uh, sorry I was unable to join right at the start. I may have already been asked. Are there distinguishing symptoms of vestibular injuries compared to CCI? In other words, is there a way to tell which diagnosis the specific attack is coming from? Yeah, Chris, so uh, let me give you two different examples here on polar opposite ends of, of that discussion that trying to move my hands here, they're all backwards, uh, that may be helpful. Um, so on the one side of that discussion, we have someone who probably has a vestibular migraine. They've got a distinct aura. So let's use the example from before. Uh, we had a patient that had flashing lights. So a patient gets flashing lights, boom, 98% of the time that precedes a headache. They then take, uh, and, that, and that with that headache, there's some imbalance. They then take Imitrex, it all goes away, or some other um, specific migraine medication. On the other side would be somebody who um, doesn't have an aura that they know of. Maybe they might feel a little bit of this or that before things, but if they turn their neck, they know they get their symptoms. They get an instant headache, they get dizzy. They put on a cervical collar. They don't get dizzy. They don't get headaches. Um, they um, they take drugs like Imitrex. Maybe helps a little, but it isn't really a home run. Uh, they went to see the neurologist. The neurologist gave them a bunch of drugs to take. None of them were a home run. Um, so the first patient, more vestibular migraine. The second patient, not vestibular migraine at all, even though they might get that label. That second patient sounds a little bit more like a CCI patient. Caleb, can a moderate disc tear in the neck directly cause the neck to feel weak? Um, possible, but unusual. Stable on three. Is occasional crunching, cracking indication of instability? I've had three PICL and, some, and symptoms have improved, but still have some cracks, crunches. Are worth DMX determined to fully stable? Um, cracking and crunching in the neck is, is kind of an indication of degenerative changes. Um, so as we all get older, um, we get cracking and crunching in the neck or cracking and crunching in our knee or cracking and crunching in the elbow. Um, it usually indicates degenerative instability with some osteoarthritis. Um, 
Does it need to be treated, not need to be treated? DMX might be a little helpful in trying to determine that. Really hands-on exam would probably be equally as helpful in trying to see if other levels need to be treated. Uh, but realize that cracking crunching is pretty normal as we get older. It's kind of normal old age stuff. Uh, Valerie, does anyone who complains of dizziness describe as a feeling of being drunk rather than vertigo? Uh, this is how I describe my dizziness. Can this be CCI related or more likely inner ear? Um, if by being drunk you mean that your balance is off, then um, that could be either inner ear, could also be upper cervical and CCI. Um, you know, Valerie, one way to try to help get some information to be a tiebreaker would be what I had talked about before. So if it's in your ear and you put on a cervical collar and that locks out the neck, if you go and turn, you're still activating your semicircular canals. So you're still gonna get dizzy. But if it is your neck and you go and turn and all of a sudden now you're no longer dizzy, then it's probably more your neck. So those are just some simple things you can do to try to differentiate between those. Obviously you need to get good hands-on exam by a qualified medical doctor. You may need to get some additional testing, et cetera. But those are easy things you can do at home to try to, to lend more credence to one side or the other. Uh, Ray, hi, Dr. C, I have CCI. Slightly off topic, but I have a large discrepancy between the centric relation draw position occlusion. Uh, this is continuous and causes parafunctional trigger to tooth bruxing. In your experience, removing wisdom teeth help at all with my CCI symptoms? Best I can tell you, Ray, is that TMJ problems are common in CCI patients uh, because of the overuse of the strap musculature up front to stabilize the head on the neck. Um, I think it would be very unlikely that getting your wisdom teeth removed would impact craniocervical instability. It could help your TMJ. I don't know. Regenix, mid advanced by Carrie Smithson. Can an 11-year-old have CCI? If so, can they have the PICL procedure? Structures be too small. I'd rather that for her than surgery. Um, yes, but we don't uh, generally treat patients that are not uh, structurally mature. So what I mean by that is that uh, they have to be uh, at or very close to their uh, final adult height. Uh, now, there are a few 11 and 12 year olds that have huge growth spurts and are 95% as tall. Uh, my daughter used to have a friend like that. I think by the time she was 12, she looked like she was 18. Um, so that happens, but more usually we tend to see structural maturity for women, for example, um, happen more along the lines of age 13, 14, 15, 16. For men, it can be later. So we'd wanna see someone structurally mature or skeletally mature before doing something like that. Having said that, we can do posterior PRP injections in that patient and sometimes get them symptomatic relief. So we've done that for some of the younger kids that aren't skeletally mature or aren't, don't have mature skeletal size yet. AT, are there any observations you have uh, personally noticed for patients that are more successful with curing their CCI, whether it's that's clinical or some sort of rehab the patient is undergoing? I think as I've said, you know, my observations are if we start with someone that's fairly functional or someone that we catch within that first year, um, those tend to be pretty amazing quick results, single procedure um, you know, going back to full activities, no problems, no issues. I think, as I've said, the longer you have this and the more severe the symptoms and disability get, the harder it is to climb out of that deeper hole. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Kimmy, sorry if I mentioned this already. Unfortunately, I was in a soft collar almost daily for two years. I've been out of it for several years, but my neck muscles are extremely atrophied. Is there a place listed on your website or blog where you discuss what kind of exercise to do, try to work these muscles back into shape? Yeah, Kimmy, uh, if you, um, let's see, probably the best thing to do would be to reach out to uh, Ryder, R-Y-D-E-R, -E my assistant, and Ryder can send you the link to, and other patients may be able to do that as well, 
to the at-home exercises we have online, that's a good place to start. That'll at least give us some information as to where you are on the scale of those atrophied muscles and how that's interacting with your CCI. Um, and uh, you can also reach out to Sherry. She could also get you those exercises as well. Caleb, curious if someone has significant atrophy in the neck muscle, it's going to take three to four months to even see beneficial results. It will take one year to get those muscles back. Yeah, Caleb, I think the best way to think about these severely atrophied muscles, and I always tell this story to patients, right? We all have had the experience, or maybe we know somebody who had a broken bone. They were in a cast. And let's say they're in the cast for eight weeks. The doctor takes it off. And the first thing they notice is those muscles are super wimpy and small, right? So let's do a thought experiment. If I were to put you into a cast for six months, and let's say I casted from your hip down to your leg on one side, and you couldn't move that leg for six months, I think we'd all agree that your leg would come out of the cast very, very shrunken up and atrophy maybe 80% atrophy. Now, if we continue our thought experiment, just from what we know from daily experience, how long would it take someone who had that kind of severe muscle atrophy, 80%, so their thigh is 80% smaller, their hamstring is 80% smaller, to get back to what it looks like on the other side? And the answer is a long time. Um, it's gonna take six months to a year to get that back, and some patients won't fully get it back. It'll always be a little smaller. Um, but most patients will get it uh, mostly back, but it's going to take a long time. So I think that's the thought experiment to do. Uh, Rishi, I've absolutely no doubt my headache is coming from the occipital nerves. and is not vascular and coming from the brain, as the pain is localized to you in an LON. The first time you did me took the pain from a six to a four, so I know would take a two or three, take it away completely. Sure, Rishi. Um, so that's a good thing to discuss when you're in the clinic. We can certainly look at that in finer detail. We may be able to add multiple higher dissection approaches to try to get different parts of the nerve at different areas. So just bring that up. Raj, uh, oh, I got you. I got PRP one time. You only drew one time. <laughs> Too bad of my vein. Uh, that means you got totally ripped off. Uh, it means it's not very highly concentrated. But if you drew eight tips of the blood in my vein, then inject the concentrate back better. Yeah, I mean, so if you go to these clinics and they're drawing one or two or three tubes of blood, unless they're injecting some extremely small joint, you're getting ripped off. You're not getting highly concentrated PRP. In all likelihood, that doctor has bought the cheapest possible PRP tube. These are called um, uh, tube-based systems. So what they're drawing the blood into is a tube that has sort of a gel in the middle. They're then centrifuging the tube. They're getting maybe one to two times concentrated PRP. And if you're middle-aged or older, you're going to need 10 to 20 times concentrated PRP. So as you can see, you're getting ripped off. Um, and if you look at trial failure, clinical trial failure for randomized controlled trials, now the good news is there's 100 successful randomized controlled trials for PRP almost more data than we have pretty much on anything. Um, and of the five or six that failed, almost all of those used these two silly tube-based systems where they only drew one or two uh, tubes of blood. So yeah, you got ripped off pretty good. And it was to improve the doctor's profits because you can buy those crazy little tube systems out of China for five bucks a pop and a, a kit to get highly concentrated PRP is gonna be 300 bucks. So as you can see for the doctor, if it's solely about the money, why not just use the $5 tube and call it good? The patient thinks they're getting PRP. I can keep the other uh, $295 for me and put it in my pocket. Uh, why do I wanna buy the $300 kit that highly concentrates the PRP and worry about taking all that blood. It's just a pain in the neck. So that's kind of what you got taken there. John, uh, 
when can you use the sauna after PRP? Is it typical to still feel pain three weeks after PRP? Um, not typical to still feel pain three weeks after PRP, unless you're in that fragile eight category or something else happened. Um, you can use the sauna after PRP. Guys, let me check my schedule. I don't know if I've got a follow on, I think I do, meeting here. I'm just trying to make sure that I'm keeping true to what I'm supposed to do here. Yeah, I do have a two o'clock. So I'm gonna have to start taking the last few questions here because I've got a two o'clock on my side that I've got to get to. Um, AT, for the issue of secondary stabilization with traps, elevator scap, or traps, elevator scalings, pulling, is it important to strengthen those muscles or more important to concentrate on stabilizing? Yeah, I think in general, those muscles are super duper overloaded. So you want to get the internal stability back, whether that be ligaments and those internal muscles, uh, more than you want to strengthen those muscles because those muscles are generally getting overworked and doing jobs they weren't designed to do. Kimmy, are the majority of patients injury patients or HEDS? Would you say you have more or less uh, that things like Lyme or mold toxicity? Um, so in our patient population these days, or at least my patients, I would say my patients are probably 40%, no, 50-50, let's say 50% EDS, 50% trauma. Um, of all of my patients, probably a third of them have a Lyme or mold toxicity diagnosis that's been given. Caleb, uh, what's the fastest injury to PICL timeframe you have treated? For example, patient injury, CCI ligaments, real flash. Um, yeah, we had a few physicians. I think I highlighted this maybe about a year ago. We had a few physicians that knew about CCI. They self-diagnosed themselves within two to three months. Um, and uh, all three of them got a single treatment and all three of them were completely better within two months and never looked back. Um, so it makes a huge difference. Um, the only reason they got those diagnoses so quickly is they knew about CCI and they went through kind of ruling out other things, but they knew pretty quickly what they needed um, and reached out. Uh, Bish, Bishnu. Uh, okay, that's to Kimmy. Gotcha. That's to Roy. Yeah, Bishnu, we don't, we don't deal with folks that advertise here. Um, so I'm not going to, not going to allow you to advertise something on this channel. Caleb, uh, do most non-operative sports medicine fellowship programs you teach the fellows how to make cheap PRP? Um, I would say that most of those, um, the good news, well, good news, bad news. Bad news is that there's certainly a lot of um, large hospital systems that still use crappy PRP systems. Um, good news is that most of those doctors uh, go to enough conferences where they understand this whole dosing conversation. I think when you get into the cheap PRP clinics, what you get are um, clinics that do a lot of other things. So let's say they're doing a little bit of bioidentical hormone stuff. They're doing a little bit of age management. They're doing a little bit of cosmetic stuff. And they're doing a little bit of injecting knees and shoulders. They don't really know what they're doing. And those are the folks that are using these cheap PRP kits in my experience. Also, a lot of the orthopedic surgical clinics don't know any better. And they're using, for instance, one of the clinic systems that you can get is Arthrex ACP. They're not using Arthrex ACP because it's a good system that concentrates stuff like it should. They're using it because they also use Arthrex A, B, and C devices, and some Arthrex rep sold it to them. So those are the two situations where I see that. Uh, Ryan is no higher section for set injection training complete different issues. It is. Um, okay, guys, I am going to have to sign off now. We got lots of great questions here. Thank you so much um, for all your great questions. Uh, no bad questions in this uh, show. Uh, and um, this coming Friday, I won't be here because I'll be in Grand Cayman. And when I'm in Grand Cayman seeing patients, this will be my last trip to Grand Cayman. 
Um, I end up uh, committing to the clinic that I'll not do an admin days and I'm working full time when I'm down there. That just works better for them. So I won't be able to do a Facebook Live, but I will be doing one uh, immediately after that. So not this coming Friday, but a week from this Friday. So I'll see you all back a week from this Friday. You have a wonderful weekend uh, and uh, I'll have some other interesting thing to talk about a week from this Friday. Uh, so have a great weekend and uh, I will see you back in two weeks. Thank you.